The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, MLC Limited, ABN 90 000 402, AFSL 230694, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Ryan Watson, CEO of Trebeca Financial, Australia's leading financial wellbeing advice firm. You're listening to a podcast series dedicated to exploring and understanding all things wellbeing through a financial advice lens. This is a special four-part mini-series from the Ensemble podcast. Over four episodes, we will talk with practitioners and wellbeing experts to understand financial wellbeing, what are its foundations, how can it be used in a personal sense, as well as taught as a practice to clients. Vivo is the award-winning health, wellness and recovery service from MLC Life Insurance. It supports people at every stage of life's journey, in sickness and in health. Vivo is available at no additional cost to MLC Life Insurance customers. And because we know advisors are the backbone of our industry, MLC Life Insurance offers some Vivo services for free to our partner advisors and their staff. To find out more, contact your distribution representative today. Morning, Amy. How are you? I'm great, Ryan. How are you? (laughs) Really good, thanks, Amy. Excited to get this conversation underway today. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to this. So I think a good place to start is to give our listeners some background in terms of your financial advice, Jenny. To this point. Sure. Well, I am a financial advisor and like many of us are going through study all over again, but I came into this profession initially not really sure what I wanted to do with myself. I was actually a trained singer and um, you know, studied acting and performing arts and worked in hospitality for what felt like an, a lifetime. And um, when I had my first son, I actually ended up working at St. George Bank. He was 12 weeks old when I started there working um, the evening sort of in the call center and in collections. And uh, basically, I was hopeless at that job because I, has, I was supposed to get a promise to pay for every 15 seconds a call dropped through. But every time I listened to a situation and an excuse for why they were in arrears, um, I was wanting to help. It was really clear to me that they could, that this was always a fixable situation. I would be asking them, oh, well, how's your cash flow and how much you, what are your fixed expenses and what have you got left over? And it was really clear that, I mean, most of these cases were preventable with insu- with advice or income protection. And I had started looking at something like um, financial advice and then decided that's it, that's what I'm going to do. And I went to RMIT to do that remotely. And then St. George Bank got wind of it and I was next thing in the wealth team doing insurance and doing my Tribeca studies. So it was sort of once, you know, once that started, it was a, the rest is history really. So it sounds like your work starting in a call center really lit your fire in terms of financial advice and your passion for the profession. It felt like that. Absolutely. I became incredibly passionate about um, wanting to learn more, wanting to help people. Uh, at first, I was a bit, uh, you know, I guess daunted by the concept that I'd have to start in insurance, but then I didn't, I was just learning, right? So I was just starting to study and then realized, well, this is actually a foundation to the financial planning process because- as I pointed out, if someone didn't have income protection and then all of a sudden they're ill and they're unable to work, if you know, that's when they end up in a situation where collections are calling them because they're not paying their credit card or their personal loan or their mortgage. In in most cases we were getting a lot of mortgage repayment issues. So, you know, it was really that one was the first, I guess, insight to the importance of income, you know, like insurance and income protection. But it sort of expanded there of, you know, thereafter. There's a lot of noise around these days around financial wellbeing. What does financial wellbeing mean to you? Mm. Well, I think financial wellbeing or having your sort of finances and having a fit sense of being in control of your finances should be part of that wellness wheel. When we consider our wellness, and we always sort of looking at being fit and eating well, and you know maybe there's a bit of what we're doing in that community, there's spirituality. But I really think that we've got to start being focusing on if we've got our finances out of whack we're usually in a lot of stress. We've got other things. We're losing sleep. There's other issues that actually affect our mental health state. 
We look at the divorce rates. We look at relationships that break down often because of money. And then you've got people who are just feeling like they're living from you know hand to mouth, week to week, because they haven't got this sense of control and they don't know where to get started. So I be I, my big thing about financial wellness is actually having a good look at where you're at and your relationship with money. It sounds like a weird, a weird thing to say, but we all have our programming. We all have this sort of self-talk or limiting beliefs around money. And some people have been raised that money is a taboo subject. Some people have been raised to, you know, certain cultures will have, you know, young girls being raised that they're going to be looked after. You get married, you get looked after. Now, I see that a lot with my older clients, older female clients, that even though they've come, they're, you know, in Australian culture, they've still got in the back of their heads that they've got to be, they're going to be looked after. You know, I've got these women in their 40s, they're fantastic career women, but they still confess that, you know, I've always thought that I was going to get married and I wouldn't have to worry about this stuff. It sounds like you've done a lot of work to understand people's mindsets and their relationship with money. How did this journey start for you? Well, initially, um, I became a bit obsessed by the concept of behavioral economics because, well, I didn't really fully understand that that was more of a, you know, more of a macro point of view, looking at why the markets were moving, why people were making these decisions. But when you started looking at individuals, and I would question, why would a client come to me excited about their financial plan, sign that SOA, get ready to get implemented, and then at review time, the things that they were supposed to do, like, for example, contribute to their super or put more on their mortgage or um, maybe start a savings plan, whatever the case would be, hadn't done it. And I would think, what if I, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get these guys engaged? And so I became a bit obsessed with the psychology of money and came across money coaching. And from that, look, you can see I've got millions of books behind me. I'm, you know, I think I've read almost every self help book um, ever printed because I was wanting to know how our brains worked. And it really comes down to neuroscience. And once I got that, um, I sort of, it's just all started to make sense. So that's how I kind of got to this point in my career with the money mindset coaching that I now um, offer as a service. I uh, implement it and weave it through my financial planning process and I also teach it. Now that we've touched on the piece around neuroscience and the way the brain is wired, tell us more about what you've learned. Well, yeah, look, it's it's uh, we could really go down the rabbit hole here, but in uh, the way sort of the neuroscience piece of it is our brain's are really operating on 95% being subconscious and only 5% conscious. So right now we're sitting here and I'm consciously aware of what I'm saying, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. The, sub- the subconscious brain is also in charge of you know just me digesting my lunch, for example. But there's also the programming in which we have experienced through our lives, mostly in our early years, and then there's also trauma, trauma experience that, that kind of can create more of that programming and we see this even with that this you know with cultural bias for example that's why I ask why are we here with women in a situation where there's a gender wealth gap that's caused by bias that's caused by our individual programming and how we treat one another in our communities and cultures so when we think about our own relationship with money we've got to look back at our childhood and see was money an issue was it discussed was it um, something that I understood around my family or were my parents fighting over it? Um, Was there a divorce perhaps, you know? And those kind of things really can give you insight to maybe what's created the relationship you've got with money now. And then once we understand that, or it could have been that you were in a business and then ripped off and now all of a sudden your attitude with money is a very different one to how it used to be. Um, So, you know, we see people who've gone through the GFC who are very now gun shy about investing, for example, because they sold out and then they realized they were at a loss. So they weren't given the right guidance and understood how the markets worked. And out of that, then, oh my gosh, I can't be investing. I I don't want to lose money ever again. That's a trigger. That's a trauma, basically. And there's now this belief that money, you know, investing is dangerous. Another example, and I used this when I was doing the FAAA Roadshow, was a client of mine had had a parents fight about money all of her life and they divorced late when she was in her teens so she got to see this all through growing up now she was great with money she actually saved for a car when before she finished high school she was independently traveling overseas in her 20s but in her mind she felt money was gross now her own, that was her own language her own words 
and she struggled to have a relationship and talk openly about money or have an open relationship about money, shall I say. Now, once we understood the the stories that was going, going on in her head, we looked at the evidence that she was great with money and we started seeing money as a positive tool and we started you know, just, just tools like being grateful, using gratitude and looking at your statement and saying, wow, that dinner with my friends was fantastic and not feeling buyer's remorse, but actually looking at your bank statement like it's a photo album, looking at the fact that you've got the roof over your head because you've just paid the mortgage or paid the rent and say, seeing that more in a gratitude point of view than money is just negative and evil. So that's sort of the process in a nutshell, I guess, and, and the, the importance of really understanding what our, you know, our subconscious programming is to unlock that and have an awareness. And then we rewire that. That's neuroplasticity. That's fantastic. How do you go about weaving the intricate parts of financial planning and financial well-being? I think this kind of process actually helps manage the compliance and knowing our client. I think we start, we're already going down that um, avenue with understanding the fact-find process, the discovery meeting, we're gathering information, the financial information about the client, but it's having a deeper conversation with the client. How did they get here? What triggered them to come to you in the first place? And sometimes it's even worth asking, how long did it take you to actually bite the bullet and come and see me? Because you'll be surprised that sometimes people have taken, they've thought about getting advice for 15 months or you know, two years. They know that they've got to do it, but it's always there's a fear or there's they're worried that they don't have enough money or that they're going to be charged or then all the other uh, other reason why people would come is because a trigger event has just occurred in their life and all of a sudden they're like oh my god I've got to do something now and having that conversation about where they feel about money how do they feel what excites them about money what scares them what do you want to change when you're thinking about your financial position right now and allow people to just open up and be real about it because I always say money is very tied with emotions and most people don't explore that until, you know, it's they're seriously triggered or they're in a situation where it's almost too late. How do you find a balance with your clients in terms of where they are at their journey, pacing and leading the key elements around financial planning, so cash flow, investment and contingency, but then also financial well-being? security and freedom of choice. Absolutely. Um, some clients, you get clients that just know that you're a financial advisor and they want to get advice. So they're not expecting me to turn around and start having a conversation around their relationship with money and what was it like with mum, you know, growing up and what, how did you feel when with against your peers with at school? Were you, you know, were you bullied? Were you, you know, those kind of conversations don't happen immediately. You warm into that. It's really reading the room. I had a client um, who recently saw me and it was going through the discovery process, but I have a critical questionnaire where it does more, ask more about how they feel around their current financial situation. So when if they're really starting to open about uh, up about their emotion, then I can that gives me a window of opportunity in that respect to start exploring that a bit more. Out of that, I will then share one of the services I offer and I start talking about what money mindset coaching was. And I give an example and I often talk, share my story and just say, well, I being self-employed was, I was going through this feast and famine process. In fact, if you look down all through my life, it always felt like one minute we're flush, next minute I'm sort of freaking out, wondering how the bill's going to get paid. And I think being authentic and honest about that and saying how I shifted that was by actually seeing where that came from. And in my case, it came from my parents. My dad had a business and then he was, you know, listing it with as a holding company under Colgate. And that was in 1986. And of course, what happens to holding companies in a crash like what we saw in 96, 86, sorry. And so that company that was going like everywhere we went, any, any supermarket on, you know, around the country, I would see my dad's shampoo and conditioner and the Winlow products. And all of a sudden that just disappeared. You know, so that, and then mum was, just, then they got divorced and mum's a single parent. I know this is very deep in terms of my story, but understanding people's backstory, and I'm a bit of a nerd when I think about backstories and Star Wars, and but, you know, understanding the backstory helps you understand how they got here, why they have those attitudes, why they have those beliefs, why maybe they think they just don't want to look at their statements, they don't want to deal with it, why they might never have been engaged in their super. 
why they've actually been worried and been driven by worry all of their lives. Ah, vulnerability. It sounds like this is a very important part of your advice journey with your clients and leading by example. Absolutely. No, I encourage all advisors to do that because as soon as they see you're human and they have that um, connection with you, the relationship is going to be so much easier. And the fact is, I say this is a friendship. This is long term. We advisors do not want to go into this process of onboarding a client to have them go in 12 months. This is an ongoing arrangement, We, especially when you've got somebody in that accumulating phase and we want to get them from there to when they retire or they've got their kids coming up. You know, they're, Now they're having their grandkids and they're worried about their adult children and they want to introduce their adult children to you because they know that you've actually helped them get to their destination. So it's it's important that we actually do take off the mask and, and be really real and connect in that level. It sounds like there's a real lead and pace approach to your advice and you in particular in terms of the clients that you take on. There's the people that you know that you can help and serve and then the others or some other people who might just not want to come on the journey with you. Yeah, not every client is actually taken on. Sometimes I'm a bit subtle with it <laughs> and I'll, I'll sort of weave in things and get them to think about things differently. Um, and other clients are just going, oh, can we make an appointment to do a bit of a tapping session? I really, I'm feeling quite anxious and I just, I know that that just calms me down a bit when it comes to me looking at my finances. And other clients, I'll, I'll get them on board. We get that process of just having an awareness of how they got here and awareness of their self-talk. And sometimes it's as simple as, do you realize that you keep saying you're terrible with money when look how, how well you've done? Let's just change that. And just little subtle things, you know, the gratitude piece I always talk about. Um, so clients are taking it on board. Sometimes they don't realize that I'm doing mindset coaching with them through the advice process though. And then there are clients that just want to see me for that. So the ones that aren't ready to come on board as a, a you know as a client and get a full strategy they just they just want to improve the relationship they've got with their money and get some get started and just kind of go right I, I kind of need to work on this a bit first how do you know what type of financial journey a new client is willing to go on again it, com- it comes down to being really open like so yeah I spoke with um, a whole bunch of women at a Mother's Day event for Tresillion there was about I think 170 women in there and I, again, went from a place of, yeah, I'm a financial advisor and these are the things we've got to consider. And all, most of these women had just given up their careers to have their babies. And the focus was more around their emotions because my experience, you know, the data I've read, the books I read, um, the clients I've seen, there's a lot of guilt uh, around, you know, being a stay-at-home parent for a period of time that you're not contributing financially. So I went straight to the heart of the emotion first so that they felt, oh, my gosh, she gets me. That's how I feel. Because if we understand someone how someone's feeling, they then can connect. So sometimes numbers mean nothing to some people. It's actually just feeling like they're being seen. So I I found myself being referred clients um, because they say, you see us, you get it, Um, versus, you know, I've got accountants that love referring business to me. We've got a private wealth farm and some of my private wealth clients I don't have these conversations with. They just want us to manage their money and that's all good. But there's this core part of my business, which is really having those relationships. And I want to see people thrive. I want to see them actually shift from being worried and feeling like they haven't got any control and feeling like they're, they're falling behind. That was one of the recent conversations I had with a new clients. So the prospecting process was a phone call. And I said, "What what's concerning you the most? Because I feel like I'm falling behind. I've got nothing to show for the money I'm earning. And I look around at all my friends and they all seem to be doing so well. And that's the other thing I always point out. How do we really know how pe- what people are really doing? Because we're in a society, you know, I in the course I call it, are you keeping up with the Kardashians? Back in the day, it was keeping up with the Joneses. Are we really seeing the true picture when we're looking at a friend who's turned up for dinner and they've got maybe a new watch or, you know, she's wearing, she's got a, a Chanel handbag? First of all, how do we know that's even real? Second of all, what's going on? What kind of, are they in a huge amount of debt maybe? And if they're not and they're doing really well, well, you know, that's fantastic. I'd be asking, what's, do, what's going on with you? You're looking fantastic. You're doing well. What's happening in your world? Ask the questions. 
make money and normal conversation. It is no longer a taboo conversation. We need to make it normal. I love that you make money conversations normal conversations. Oh, there's, oh gosh, there's a, there's a lot. There is so much because we're in a society where we've got instant gratification in every way. Like even my watch tells me something straight away. We're basically addicted to this dopamine, which isn't a bad thing, but we've got to definitely work on where and why we're getting it. So where are we getting it from? Why are we getting it? And we've got to train our brains to get it in a healthy manner. But we've been, we're fed marketing and advertising everywhere, and that is programming and it's subconscious programming. So our brain has this thing called a reticular activating system. It's a little filter. So we'll get, I can't even tell you the actual number right now, but trillions of data comes in and then that breaks it down to about 128 uh, bytes per second. So we get so much more than what we filter as important. So these advertising companies will actually create a sense that that's important to us and all of a sudden we're starting to see things that appeal to us. For example, when the Kardashians were quite famous and doing their reality TV show, all of a sudden you would be walking around and seeing women dressing a similar way, even getting their lips filled and all sorts of changing the way they look because they saw that as a sense of being important and fitting in. That's the other thing is we've all got um, – we're, we're, our brains are designed to keep us alive and safe. So one of the things we have to consider when we're thinking about purchasing is, is this actually fulfilling me? Is it keeping me alive? Or – in terms of that, what programming has created me wanting this is it to fit into society because fitting in is a co- part of being alive. And you know, back in the day, in the, you know, tribal times, if you were shunned from your tribe, that's death. That would not be surviving. So you needed to be included. So in society now, we've inherited this programming, and in society now, we want to feel like we're accepted and included. So. You know, that, that can actually play out with how people spend their money and make financial decisions massively. Where do you sit on it being about delayed gratification versus the here and now? So some today and some for tomorrow. Absolutely. But at the same time, I, I be, I'm a big believer of money is a great tool for us to enjoy our lives. It's back to that wellness piece is look at it like this is keeping us alive. So we've got to enjoy it. We've got to see it as always the gift that keeps on coming. You know, if we get our salary comes in every single week, we've got to, you know, enjoy that. We've got to enjoy our lives and, you know, have our social life and have things that we like. But the key thing here is to cut back down to what their values are. If we understand that they've got a goal to say, I want to save money to travel or I want to save money for my first home, once we understand what that goal is, we've got to make sure that they, those goals are in line with their true values, their core values. Because when we understand our values, the fact is everything in life has got to have a compromise. So if it's in line with your values and that goal will first, firstly be more achievable if it's in line with your values. But when you've got a situation where you've got to make a decision around a finan- a, you know, like a financial transaction, you've got to be sitting there consciously aware, having a moment of going, okay, Is this in line with my values? Is this in line with my goals? And when we start programming ourselves with that, we're kind of now going, okay, I've just made that decision. And now we celebrate that moment. That's where we go, awesome, fantastic, do a little happy dance, do something, celebrate in one way or another, put a fun dance, a song on, and allow that dopamine hit to happen. How important is it for you, Amy, to understand your client's money story, their relationship with money? Um, and how they've grown to build on that relationship with money. Depending on everybody is different. So depending on the the, the client, they're where they're at, and what they're open to um, explore. So first tool would be going down that rabbit hole of understanding what was life like growing up. Let's have a look at um, what you experienced as a child or what trigger events occurred. So going through that um, sort of what we call the emotional fact find. So once we go through that emotional fact find, it depends on what doozies we find, we get, what comes up, you know, it really, it's a minefield in that respect. Sometimes it's, it can be just a self-talk and that can be really easy to overcome because it's like you're catching yourself. And I always say, you know, things like affirmations and gratitude, it sounds really woo-woo, but it is actually shifting a perspective and creating a new habit and belief. It sounds like EQ or awareness is a key part of the advice process for you? The key thing is awareness. 
And one thing I do do that's on the more technical side of, of being an advisor, no matter how much a client earns, I will ask how 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 do they do manage their cash flow and their finances, and are they do they feel like they're in control? Do they have an idea of what their surplus is, what their wiggle room is? Most cases, people are a bit embarrassed and really don't have an idea. Um, some some clients I do have them. They're just like gold star, awesome. That's fantastic. Um, you you're good. <laughs> you're good to go. There are, yeah, and usually then that they're the ones that have got fear around investing or something else. But it's what what I do is I get ninety days. I, I look at ninety days in a CSV file from their bank. They've got multiple bank accounts. We've got a quick system. We just scan through, we sort so it's all alphabetical order, and we can basically pull that apart very quickly and work out, work out well, they're fixed, they, you know, their electricity bills, that's mortgage, um, their school fees. But then there's this sort of grey area of what we'd say variable and discretionary. I call variable being that each week your petrol and your shopping, um, that does change. So we've got to sort of work out well, what would be the comfortable amount that we would put as our variable living costs and then there's a discretionary. And sometimes it's a bit of an eye-opener to say, this is what you've been spending on whatever that they're, you know, tickles their fancy. And you know something? I'm not about saying don't. It's about being aware. And so, some people are spending blindly because of the programming, because of advertising, because they are keeping up with the Joneses or the Kardashians and they are catching up with their friends and spending more than they probably like to, to spend. And once we can go, all right, now we've got to look at, now we know these numbers, is there anything you want to change? That's back on them, not me. Not me saying you can't spend that anymore. What is it that you feel that you need to change here if there is anything you need to change? And going back to your goals and back to your values, we can always tell, money tells a story, the values are right there with what they spend, where they're spending the money. You know, I always find it hilarious when someone comes to me I'm really thinking I should get an investment property That's what, or buy a house or whatever. That's what everyone, my parents are telling me to do. That's what my friends are saying I should do. And all they want to do is they're saving for the next trip to Europe for the summer. And, and then they want to go and do a ski trip in, in January. And you're kind of thinking, maybe your values are not in line with the uh, whole idea of actually buying property. Maybe we look at another investment approach so you can live this life and have the liquidity as you need it. It's just so valuable getting to know your clients at such a deeper level, helping them understand what is truly important to them, removing more of society's values, not worrying about keeping up with the Joneses or the Kardashians, and just focusing on what's really important to them and their family unit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, I mean, we've got to get to know our clients in the most detailed way. Numbers re- already tell us a story, and I think every advisor would be nodding their head with that. And once we want to know what their goals are, and I'm a big believer in short-term goals as well as the big picture, so they might be worried that they're not going to have enough to retire with, but that's not going to keep them engaged if they're retiring in 10 years' time. So what we've got to look at is, okay, what are we going to focus on this year? How much are we going to contribute perhaps? And so again, going back to the cash flow piece and that how that sort of like opens a can of worms in conversation anyway. Then we kind of work out perhaps they actually are struggling with that clarity in ter- just even defining what their their needs are. Okay, now we've got to go back and discuss more around their relationship with money because they are feeling a bit overwhelmed by even committing to something. So it's really being guided. Every single case is different. It's it's that soft skill, which I don't believe we should ever call soft because it's a hard skill. It's difficult, but you've got to read those clients. And I believe there's no such thing as a dumb question. You And you warn your clients that you're going to ask a lot of questions. You're going to understand them in such detail. And I always warn them, relationships with money varies from one person to another. So couples are also fascinating because one you know, one party will have a completely different background to another, different upbringings, different beliefs, and yet all of a sudden they think they're going to come together and be in synergy with a financial plan. Now, I want, I remember sitting with a couple and she was like, I don't like being told if I've got a budget. I just want to spend. And like, right. And yet he's come to me with a big spreadsheet and that's, you know, and I was like, okay, well, let's just break this up a bit. Again, you, you can't spend 
the fixed because they're committed. You've got a contract with all of these companies. You have to pay them. So what we work on is then you've got your own money and that's where you get to play and do what you want that's you know in line with who you are as an individual and he's got his. I'm a big, I'm a big believer in having that autonomy and also having your you know, joint goals. So I haven't really answered any of your, your questions directly because it is uh, a case-by-case situation. But in terms of, say, a mind map or a matrix, the key part is that discovery process, asking these questions and really getting an idea of, I guess, where they're at. And that also is a great place to have those conversations around risk profiling too. For those advisors listening out there, what is the best way to bring some of these ideas into their daily practice with their clients? That's the key thing. Um, I launched a online, sorry, this is a bit of a shameless plug, but I launched, I launched an online um, course with my business partner called Money Mindset Coaching for financial advisors. And we, any student who goes through that, they go through having to bring on at least two practice clients. And a lot of our students are advisors because they they want to actually bring this kind of service in. And it's great because they can do it as a standalone service, add on to bring in revenue, or they can bring it into their practice. And I use my experience because I, I bring it into my practice more so than just do one-on-ones. But the point being is that you must be just willing to jump in and, you know, tell your clients, look, I'm, try- I'm trying something different. Bear with me here. And I would love your feedback, by the way. I sort of did a book, I did a beta launch last year for, it was an online financial literacy course, which I included the mindset coaching concepts in it. And I went to a recruiting company and I did a presentation and I got a good 10 client, 10 students out of that. I said, guys, it's the beta launch. Um, so bear with me. We had tech problems. You know, we had little hurdles that I wasn't expecting. They loved it though because they knew you manage your expectations, manage your clients' expectations and if as soon as people actually are aware, they're all good with it because you communicated that. So if you all want to bring something in you, tell them. What does your ongoing service proposition look like with your clients? I find that my clients' engagement in their finances has increased. Um, you know, I also have a rule that we meet twice a year. The first, if you can't do actual face-to-face, it's at least a phone call with me just to touch base how you're going. Um, and then I do short those short-term goals as well. But the engagement piece has definitely accelerated because I am having these more deeper conversations with people. And we've had a very interesting, you know, 16 months, right, with the, the market's volatility, interest rate rises, inflation issues, cost of living is soaring. There's a lot of nervousness out there. And I think the key thing that we've done in the business has actually kept this, you know, communication going and open and checking in with people because although we can be all very technical with the strategy, which I love too, I love getting into my spreadsheets and create strategies and I love looking at research and um, I get excited with when we get a nice positive return for our clients in in the portfolios that we construct. But, they're, you know, they're not too fussed about that. That's actually the roadmap. You know, they don't, and then it's not about how I built that road for them. They just want to know that they're on the road and they're on the right track. I think we all understand. And I think from a compliance point of view, that actually all works very well in that communication piece. How far do you push into financial wellbeing with your clients? Absolutely. Well, I actually um, take it a little bit further than that with, with my clients. Once we understand how our brains are constantly being programmed, we've got to be aware of what programming we're allowing to actually occur with ourselves, our minds. So I, if, if negative news is really stressing people out, don't watch it. Don't get involved. Don't buy into it. How are you going as an individual? How's your household going? How are you tracking versus what we're told should be happy, how we feel? So it could be if we realign that thought of I'm actually sure I've got my mortgage and I'm on track and I know that I'm actually paying a bit more into my offset knowing that there's going to be another interest rate rise, but I'm prepared because I've already got that sorted out with my cash flow. I'm tracking good. I'm celebrating my wins. I'm, you know, I'm in a space of being grateful for where I'm at. Then that noise goes away. So I'm always, I I did a podcast on that um, not that long ago because there was just so much noise, so much negativity. And yeah, it's really, really important to know the news and financial news more so. I sort of go, this 
stuff out there that is absolutely horrible and horrific and I don't really want to be exposed to that. I just want to you know, be in my bubble right now and enjoy the life I've got. And I know that sounds a bit like sometimes, you know, it's a very Pollyanna approach to life, but um, it works for me and it works for some people that I work with. So if, if the news is overwhelming and causing you anxiety, maybe you need to limit what you're taking in. But I also want to encourage people, read the AFR, understand exactly what's going on uh, or, you know, sitting on here or, or other, you know, money management magazine, whatever it is that you are enjoying, I would encourage you to educate yourself and be financially literate and understand why the markets are doing what they're doing, understand why the RBA are increasing our rates, all of those things, but also look at the flip side of what's going on. Why are they doing that? What's the positive out of that? You know, there is a positive out of that. Our cash rate's going up. I mean, great. We're actually making money when we put money in a bank. Woo, yay, for the first time in a long time. You know, um, also the fact is this is a correction of what was a very bullish market where people go, oh, gosh, I've lost 10% of my portfolio in the last 12 months. I was like, how about we look at the year before and see that you were sitting maybe at 25% or 30%. What we've done is we've just given back some and we just focus on the ongoing rolling average return over a period of time, not the last two years because that's causing anxiety and it's unnecessary and it's not the real picture given you're going to be invested for another 10 or 15 years. And I think that's what it, the job is really. I guess that's the mindset piece is shifting that perspective and te- giving the tools to remind them themselves to be conscious about what thoughts. Am I in the present, the past, or the future? And if you're in the future freaking out about a potential outcome that hasn't even happened, you've got to rein it back in and go, no, I've got to be present. And there could be infinite possibilities, all very positive infinite possibilities, but why am I focusing on the negative outcome? And asking those questions, 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 really is the key. Would you mind telling us about a few success stories that you've had with your clients, whether you've really got traction in this financial wellbeing space? Yeah, there's been a few. I actually want to get a couple more on my podcast to interview, and I've had two that have come on. I think people are a bit shy with that stuff. Um, one actually uh, has come on, Chelsea. She, in six months of doing mindset coaching with me, ended up being debt-free, engaged, um, bought a house, and has a really positive relationship with her finances and positive talk and celebrates her wins. Another client of mine um, felt completely overwhelmed with where she was heading in life. She thought she was being left behind. That was, I get that a lot with women. I think that they're, they're not doing well, and she didn't think that she could manage. She wasn't managing her finances. Like she was, oh, I'm hopeless with money. This self-talk, I'm, oh, I, I, I don't know. I know what I'm doing. I can't do this. She was, I can't do this without you. And I'm like, hang on a minute. And she, this divorced mother who actually set up her own business, financially successful, paying down a mortgage. And I'm like, are you serious? Let's have a look at the evidence first. You actually can do this. You've done a lot without me. Now we're going to get you some more direction so that what you've created and what you've built, now we're going to direct it to build you something more, you know, and go further. So she sort of shifted her perspective as well because she built a business and she didn't think she could actually get to a point where she could feel like she was on top of things financially and that she was even going to be able to retire or pay down a mortgage. What an inspirational story. I love hearing real life advice success stories. It's really where the rubber hits the road with clients. Our brains are um, you know, trainable. So that's the neuroplasticity piece. So it's simply about rewiring those beliefs. So we've got this belief, oh, I'm hopeless with money. She, you know, she told me she was hopeless with money because that's what her ex-husband used to say to her, you know, and then she started to see the evidence of actually I created this. Yeah. I mean, she had to have somebody like myself say, okay, so who started the business? Who, who's, you know, paying the bills in the household? Who covers the cost of your groceries? Like, of course, it's obvious it was her, but in her mind, she just had no confidence and awareness of how good she was tracking. The power of growth versus fixed mindset. I know at Tribeca Financial, we're a big one for understanding that and how it can affect change. And as we know, the growth versus the fixed mindset, we're often competing against you know that caveman or cavewoman brain. Because our brains are designed to keep us alive, but the bear's not going to come out of the cave. So we've got a lot of we, we've got a lot of programming here that is actually out of date, and we've got to have an awareness of okay, my body functions, 
it's, it's doing what it's doing. My subconscious is actually keeping me physically alive, but the brain functions, the thoughts, the beliefs, you know, the sensationalizing stories is not actually serving me. And you've got to catch yourself. Is this serving me? Is this thought serving me? Is that self-talk serving me? Is that keeping me on track with where I want to be? Who I want to be? I mean, that's the other thing I talk about is the future self. Like our subconscious doesn't know time, space, or reality. So why not start being that person now, the mo- right now in the moment that is wealthy, that is a good decision maker? What kind of what kind of self talk do they have when they're looking at uh, you know their finances or when they're making a financial decision? That wealthy person, what kind of decisions are they making? Because if we can start thinking. I'm already that person, I'm already there, I'm already earning X amount or I've already got that retirement saving. It shifts a lot that's going on in the background that we don't even know is there. How important is it, do you think, for an advisor to practice what they preach? I think they start with yourself and that's something we do with the course. We put the advisor through the process. So um, actually go through your own money story. We, um, I'll put in the links, there's actually a, a downloadable um, document. You can actually go through the questions and everything. But I think the first start, first thing is you start with yourself. You you go down that rabbit hole yourself and go, what is my what is my relationship like with money? And you be really honest with yourself. And you look at your fears around finances. You look at where you are situated right now. What you want to improve. What scares you the most. What excites you the most. Go through that process, um, and then start capturing some of those beliefs. And start seeing it for yourself, and then all of a sudden, you're it, it will it's mind blowing, honestly. It's quite a good experience. What did you learn by going through this process yourself? Well, I had an awareness for the first time that I'd ever had. I didn't, I didn't realize how much baggage I was carrying around my relationship with money and why I kept getting this getting stuck. It actually was stunting my growth as an advisor, in fact, because. There was this limiting belief that I was just like life was always going to have to be challenging. Financial, my financial situation, because I was a single parent, um, oh, it's going to always be really hard. And I was constantly creating that reality. That's basically what we do is we, we create our reality with, because of our thoughts. Our thoughts create our reality. So if we can shift those thoughts, we shift our reality. So how do you help your clients create that mindset shift? It's again a, a question. If I don't do anything now about this situation, where will I be next year? Where will I be in five years? Where will I be in 10 years? And if we're really honest with ourselves about that, if we're in a situation where we're not that great, we're not very happy with our financial position or our financial well-being, what's that going to look like in 10 years' time if you do nothing about it? So it's about going, well, I've got the responsibility now to take action. If I want my situation to change in 12, 12 months' time and 10 years' time, I've got to do something about that now. And I think we've got to just ha- ask ourselves those honest questions. If I don't do it today, where will I be in 12 months? And how will I feel about myself then? I love the saying, if nothing changes, nothing changes. If you want something in life to change, you have to change something in your life. Jeez, it seems like we have covered a lot today, Amy, in a short amount of time. No, I think we covered so much. Well, I guess... I think if we all started taking more of a proactive approach to all looking within to how we got here as individuals and shifting our perspective around things, we'd also start seeing and asking those questions about how we got here as a society and where these you know, cultural biases come from. Because if we are all prepared to change and grow as individuals, that'll make a big rippling effect and shift in the world that we live in in a more positive way. I believe it'll actually fix a lot of issues that we're seeing with, you know, the fact that 53% of women worry daily about money. That's not a great statistic that, you know, we're seeing still a gender pay gap is sitting at 22% from last year, which creates a, a gender wealth gap on average is about 30%. We've got to shift all this. And the only way we're going to do that is actually changing now, you know, our beliefs around how we treat money and are with money. It starts within, it starts in our households. First as an individual, then in our relationships, and then it goes further than that. A bit of a loaded question here, but who do you think can lead the change with everyday Australians? I think advisors really, um, and I said this on the road, just if anyone been there, um, probably hear me repeat myself, but I think we all as advisors have a responsibility to share these stories 
about our clients and obviously protect their identities, but share their wins, share their experiences. Because if people see the human approach we have and what we do and the great work we do as advisors, more people might actually be prepared to come and see us sooner than later and not be waiting for some severe trigger event or to the point where they are losing sleep over it, but actually go for a positive experience and want to take more control over their their financial well-being and their finances. I think we've all got to share those stories. And also when we're talking to clients or talking to prospects, it's a matter of saying, look, everybody is in a similar situation. We're all, most people are embarrassed about their finances. Most people avoid it. Um, if, you know, depending on, of course, what their situation is, read the room, have those soft skills, listen. But once you kind of get an idea, if they're nervous about something, make sure that they understand that you're there to help them and you understand them and you see them and you're listening. The power of empathy in an advice relationship. What about advisors starting out on this journey? Where do you think they should start? Get mentors. Find lots of mentors and use your mentors' experiences or their clients' outcomes and say, I personally haven't been through a divorce. However, my mentor, so-and-so, and that's this is the work that we've done in the business to help these clients. You know, so getting a mentor is imperative, I believe. You know, that's what we do. We've got our professional years. They're being mentored. They're being coached. They're being, we're going through that year of, I guess, onboarding into being a financial advisor. But I don't, I just say, don't stop there. Keep learning. And if you haven't come across a case and you've just come across, you know, had a conversation or a discovery meeting and you go, whoa, I've never been in this situation or I've never bought a business. I've never, I've never done this, that or the other. Go and speak to your other advisors. We've got these great communities like this one here um, and the ensemble, right? So we've got them. So why not actually get on the chat and say, has anyone ever come across this? There's nothing wrong with asking. In fact, I think that's where we've got to be really brave and ask for help. I love this piece around the advice industry and advice professions being collegiate, helping each other to generate great client outcomes, all about wins and learnings. There's not a problem when a group of advisors together that they can't solve together. Absolutely. I don't believe there's any competition between us. We've got a, we've, we're all here to help each other now. If, you know, we, there's not enough of us to get around. There's so many Australians that need advice. They don't understand what we do. Um, you know, I quote Jenny Pierce a lot because she said once, we're an industry that talks to itself. And it was so, it was so true when I heard that. I was like, that's so true. And a lot of that is negative stuff or updated on, you know, updates on policies. And what about let's talk about what we do and share stories if we're going to talk to ourselves and start talking to our communities as well so that, and sharing our client stories and get our clients to maybe come on a podcast or to, you know, be interviewed so that you can write up a, a blog post or whatever you're, you know, into. But I think we all have a responsibility to get out there and um, make that kind of noise for each other and cheer each other on. Again, no competition whatsoever. You know, there's too much work out there. It's crazy. Well, it's been great having you on the podcast today, Amy. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thanks for having me.